Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Right. True. Bigotry in America. Here we are with Peter Hoffenberg, um, a, a welcome returnee to our table. Um, and we're going to talk today uh, about, uh, about um, bigotry and anti-Semitism uh, after uh, the incident in Pittsburgh, Tree of Life at the Tree of Life. Um, but it, you know, it wraps around to a global issue. Before we do that, oh, I'd like to take a moment and get your reaction to President Trump's withdrawal of the troops, American 2,000 American troops from Syria. What's your reaction? Well, my reaction is, uh, again, not as an expert. So welcome and lovely shirt, by the way. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I looking, say the same you are looking you, very dashing today. <laughs> um, I think the initial reaction is, is once again, we have a, a chief executive who seems to make a decision suddenly, um, seemingly irrationally, because uh, most of his experts have opposed this. So uh, I guess the response would be in two directions. One is, as a presidential action, it seems very consistent with his behavior. Uh, secondly, uh, once there, the troops do provide a, a very significant strategic buffer zone. So the question is, one, who replaces that? And the great fear, of course, is Iran. Uh, or Iranian-backed troops. Secondly, who does this seem to favor in addition to Iran? And from my reading, which is rather limited, again, I apologize, it seems that it's particularly in uh, Turkey's interest. So because Turkey's fighting with the Kurds. Right, fighting with we the Kurds. We have been supporting the Kurds. Uh, Turkey has a very strategically significant <clears throat> role there. It's ironic and more than probably uh, late night talk show ironic that this occurs in Turkey's favor at the very same time that uh, General Flynn has been charged with supporting Turkey as a foreign agent. It, it's, Ooh, it seems to be that this, chilling. this has a, a Turkey. But again, please, Jay, I, uh, we're old friends. One more so question I don't, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm just telling you my, my superficial views. Sorry. Russia. Where does Russia come well, out on this? Uh, Russia also could play a significant role. And I think perhaps for some geopolitical uh, visionaries, uh, Turkey and uh, Russia would provide some kind of loggerhead intention that Turkey would be allied with NATO and the U.S. and do its interests vis-a-vis -vis trying to control the Russians. As a 19th century historian, um, this reminds me very much of old views of the world, which were great power views. Uh, great powers controlled various regions, and it was up to other great powers to essentially uh, say, you control that region, you stay out of my business. I think a lot of people quite naturally forget that uh, the Second World War was not a world war until 1941. It included eight vicious years of regional conflict. Yes. With Japanese expansion, particularly yes. in China, uh, vicious. But, but, well, I shouldn't say but, and a regional issue. Uh, Germans, Germany and Italian expansion, regional issues. And then in late 41, it became a a world war. And I think some folks like myself worry a little bit about this because uh, even if the conflicts are regional, uh, the they, tributes, ramp the tribu they, they ramp up and the tributaries do go back. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a very, and I'm not, again, not profound in any means at all, it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, it's particularly dangerous for Israel in this case. I think very dangerous for uh, American troops that are left, who now will be relatively small uh, in number. And if we're really concerned about uh, the Syrian people themselves, I wouldn't rely on the Republic of Turkey to be too concerned about Syrian human rights. No, yeah. I mean, uh, I uh, generally am favorable, just as an individual and as a citizen towards our previous president, generally favorable. But I think the long-term legacy of the Obama administration will be besmirched a bit by Syria. Something, yes, yes. something should have been been done. So sorry, that's a long wordy way well, of for right. not an expert. I apologize. Just want to make a discussion right. relevant, maybe maybe somehow maybe somehow touch that subject. So uh, a friend of mine sent me a, a link to a uh, a video on YouTube. Uh, it was really really interesting. It's a, it's about a defector, a Soviet defector, and he talked about active measures and uh, disinformation there, KG, KG, uh, you, KG, KGB KGB campaign. Right. And what was interesting was that the link was from a, a talk he gave, he's in the United States now, a talk he gave years ago. This is not something they just started doing. They're trying to divide, to find flaws in our society and divide us. And it strikes me that 
that one of their targets, he didn't say this in so many words, one of their targets is racism. One of, the, one of their other targets has to be anti-Semitism, don't you think? Well, I think not only is that true, but again, um, I might say I am shocked that there is gambling in this establishment. <laughs> uh, because if you, if you look at one of the most infamous forms of disinformation or fake news, you can go back to the Tsarist secret police who wrote the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, distributed that uh, via Henry Ford and others. Uh, it's still available, um, not just for purchase, but free on certain uh, websites. And that is perhaps what the Ur document, in many cases, of, of misinformation uh, from that region of the world. Um, what, what I don't understand, and you're a history professor, 19th century, but also other periods I know, um, is, is I don't understand where it comes from. I know it, it's deep and it's ancient. Where does it come from and how could, how could the snowball still be rolling? Well, I hope uh, your viewers don't mind if we stay for a few weeks and to have uh, this discussion. And you ought to bring a little food and drink. It's, it's hard to talk about anti-Semitism without a good pastrami sandwich. Um, you ask uh, a wonderful question and a question which is complimentary in many cases to, and I'm not equalizing them because each of them is valuable, uh, equal to, for example, um, you know, misogyny, which has seemingly ancient and perpetual uh, vibrance in society. Uh, certain forms of, of racism. So I want to answer your question, and as I answer your question, uh, I want to recognize that even though there is not an equality, there is an endurance and a longevity to certainly seemingly uh, central hatreds, um, certainly central uh, either intolerance or sometimes the reverse, like over patronizing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so to answer your question, uh, which is. Uh, <laughs> multifaceted, as we like to say, and complex. Um, let's take a couple of very uh, basic answers to begin with, and then play around with, with, each, with each of them. So one is the question of whether or not, as Robert Wistrick says, this is the longest hatred, which is not to say that it is a hatred which is, in fact, longer than any other. But what I think he wants to say is, apropos of your comment, it is an enduring hatred. Yeah. So one approach is to try to understand of the long-term causes of anti-Semitism, and to see anti-Semitism, as Hannah Arendt, the great uh, German-Jewish philosopher, said, almost um, like lava. It's always there, and in certain circumstances, it explodes in a volcano, but the lava continues to be there. So that's, that's one approach. And, and if that is the approach, then one might say uh, that uh, the Jew has always uh, provided a face for one, uh, a sense of conspiracy. Jews have always been considered to be disproportionately powerful and disproportionately, uh, shall we say, influential in local, world, national affairs. And to a certain degree, that goes back to the idea, of course, that uh, Jews killed Jesus, that there was some kind of uh, conspiracy among uh, Jewish elders uh, and the rabbinate, the Sanhedrin. All right, so that's one component that some scholars would say almost any society needs to find a face to uh, represent its fears. And the Jews have provided a very, very flexible variant face. So if your fear is capitalism, right, the Jew. Reverse side, if your fear is communism and labor unrest, the Jew. If your fear is big banks, the Jew. If your fear is too much sex in movies, Hollywood, the Jew. All right. Uh, if your fear is the loss of uh, Catholicism and tradition in France, the Jew. Okay, so that's one, we would say, long durée, and that combines a sense of conspiracy uh, and a sense that whatever it is one fears or whatever it wants to purge, then in fact uh, the Jew is present. So that, that's one, one approach. It's dynamic, too, because some of these fears we haven't had yet. So any fear right. is, could be cause for anti-Semitism. Exactly. Now, the second approach uh, embedded in your excellent question is, well, maybe there are some uh, newer aspects to explain uh, anti-Semitism. And what I would like uh, viewers to think about is it's really not an either-or proposition. Right? There are aspects of what we call the new anti-Semitism, yes. which were not present 150, 200 years ago, but they're not 
diametrically she opposed. They, they dance Adam together. Asked, so like, two questions very a good time. dancers <laughs> who have always been there and now can actually dance a tango together. But so you're suggesting it's not really a continuum. It reemerges. Well, it's a continuum in the sense that uh, the basic sense of what I don't like <laughs> or what scares me. Yeah. And that there's a conspiracy out there pulling strings to alienate me or to attack me. Those are consistent. Okay. The new aspect, sometimes in our circumstances, and I want to be very careful here because, um, like the term fascism or racism or this or that, that always gets thrown like a blanket, doesn't really do us do much any good. Doesn't really do uh, any any uh, process towards or progress towards resolving the problem. But one of the arguments now is that there is a new anti-Semitism. And that new anti-Semitism is tied to a few clear historical developments, which may have many positive aspects to them, but their negative aspects are grabbed onto by anti-Semites. And recent, so, you're talking about recent. Right. So say events. in the last 10, 15, 20 years. That's so pretty recent. for example, one of the uh, common arguments is the new anti-Semitism is propelled by Israel's existence and Israel's actions. So then we have to be very careful, right? Uh, is that, in fact, as we unpack it, <laughs> very similar to some old views? So, for example, in the American political discourse, the idea that uh, the American Israel Political Action Committee, APAC, pulls the strings and gets the Congress and the executive to support Israel is really a return to this conspiracy argument, right? right. That there yeah, are yeah. powerful Jewish interests. Okay, now I want to be very careful here again. That I'm not saying this uh, to suggest that everything Israel does is good or beneficial, okay? And here's where we really want to delineate, right? Uh, so is an attack on Israel, for example, uh, consistent with some of these older views and consistent with the argument that Israel as is a Jewish state or nation is illegitimate and has no rights to exist. Those all seem very close to a new anti-Semitism. A criticism of Israeli uh, political actions and in many cases human rights violations without saying that that's because people are Jewish or that's because they're Israeli, but in a universal sense is not anti-Semitism. So we want to be very, very careful. And unfortunately, the two extremes, as you well know, uh, cling to their absolutes, right? So any attack on Israel is seen as anti-Semitism, uh, or any attack on Israel is not seen as anti-Semitism. Well, yeah, but but the, the, the middle area, so that's an example. I am anti-Semitic. You are. Okay, if I am. If you were, okay. If I am. You can't wear that I'm shirt. Not, yeah, not. I mean, this is, right, this, <laughs> is, a, sure this is the Hebrew semi shirt, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> right. No. Right, like, this is. If I am anti-Semitic, right. I say, well, let's see, uh, I, want to, I want to attack Israel on the human rights issue. I want to criticize everything they do, and I want to really be shrill about my criticism. But that's not my real reason for attacking them. In other words, I'm shifting reasons. It's a pretend reason. The real reason is I'm anti-Semitic. So, I mean, I think you do find that, don't you? You find people who, it's the sheep and the wolf in sheep's clothing. Oh, there's no, there's no doubt. I just don't think that it's much of a value to cover everybody with that blanket. You could have a pure, non-anti-Semitic person who doesn't like the human rights uh, condition in Israel. Right. I mean, it'd be a reminder of, you know, in the 1960s, somebody yelling, you know, America, love it or leave it. Okay, if you're, there's a very strong, patriotic, progressive, radical tradition in the United States which says the U.S. can do better. That doesn't mean you don't like the U.S., mm, right. okay? And there's a tradition within Judaism and a tradition within Israel. I mean, the, the loudest critics of human rights violations in Israel uh, are very often Jews, among the loudest. It doesn't and necessarily... In the U.S., too. Right, it doesn't necessarily make them... So we're having, I, I, I think, what I hope will be um, a moment of sort of turning down the heat. You know, let, let's, let's talk about these issues, think about these issues as what our end goals would be, and yes, you're right, there are anti-Semites in the other camp opposing Israel, and there are Israelis who are intolerant of Muslims and Christians as well. So I think the idea is to let's turn down the heat. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I think that the, the most significant issue is the end to which we are moving in the Middle East. So for example, are we moving to a dual state? 
situation, okay? Are we moving to a single state, unitary state situation? Are we moving towards the removal of all Jews from the region? I mean, these are sort of, these are the $64,000 questions to, to ask. Now, is, is, another, a static, is a static result possible? Well, a static result is possible, but nothing stays static, which means that of all of the issues that, again, since you're my friend, I'll, you know, we, we can be very honest, uh, it will have a detrimental effect on Israel. Israel is changing. And um, if Israel is committed to peace and justice and a dual state and a democratic society, which those of us who are political dinosaurs, as Woody Allen would have said, you know, I'm a, I'm a social stereotype, I have Ben Sean on my wall. Um, if, that, if that's the goal, then Israel also has to change and can't expect everybody else to change. But I think it's fair to ask, I mean, uh, is the goal a single state from the Jordan to the sea? If that's the goal, um, it won't be a Jewish state. And if it were a Jewish state, it would be a Jewish state with a demographic majority of non-Jews. So neither of those are necessarily viable opportunities. Uh, is it the removal of all Jews? And I think we can accept that those who claim the removal of all Jews are anti-Semites. I think that's pretty, pretty clear. I've been saying that for a long time. Right, right. And some people have, sure, ab absolutely. Uh, and other people are still uh, clinging to the idea that, uh, which I think Americans sometimes find difficult to believe, but most of the world can recognize um, some people really don't want to live in the same state. They're willing to live as, as neighbors, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that may be the case. I mm -hmm. mean, the idea of partition, uh, mm -hmm. which somehow smacks uh, not very, as not very acceptable to Americans who want these large nation states and everybody yeah. to kind of get along. But, but so, partition is the reality of most of world Is partition history. practical, though? You know, there, well, there has been partition right, now, in the past. Now, didn't work. Now, that gets to, I mean, we're getting a little bit off of the topic, but I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about okay, it. I just want yeah. to ask one more question. Well, I was just going to say that it would work. Partition would work if both states are viable. And that's where I think that um, at least, in many cases, legitimate criticism of the Israeli government is not necessarily anti-Semitism, which is to say if we were to continue the settlement and property pro projects of the Netanyahu government, would the end result be a viable Palestinian state or not? And that, that I don't think is inherently an anti-Semitic question. That's inherently actually a, a Zionist question to have a viable Israel next to a viable Palestinian state, whatever name the Palestinians uh, out of their sovereignty would like to call it. I, I would assume it'd be Palestine. Um, if that's the goal, if that's what I'm saying, the, the end goal has to be where we really put our minds to. If that's the end goal, then criticism of actions towards that goal are not inherently anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. I mean, the easy one is no Jew from Jordan to the sea. That's easy. So the, the gray area and the sheep's uh, question to ask is of those who want a unitary democratic state, what goal would they see or what future would they see for a minority Jewish community in that state? And among the Jewish demographics, the ascent would be orthodox religious families who have far more children than secular and over or time. Right. So that could be an exploding bomb, right? And that's the question I think you have to ask when people say, let's have one state. All right, how do you envision the Jews living in that state? And that's a question which is not unique by any means at all. If Jinnah were here, he'd ask the same question. Look, you're gonna leave India. Uh, what is gonna be the role and future of a large, numerous, but minority Islamic community? And I think even though there are obviously, I mean, it's, it's the most uh, nuclear potent uh, border in the world. Uh, most people would argue that that probably saved Islamic lives and reduced the internal violence within India by, now that the process of getting there killed three to four, three million people, it's horrendous. But the process of getting there should suggest to us what would have happened if they stayed, sorry. 
No, you I can't ask know, a, I mean, you so can't ask a historian. Yeah, I mean, flood out of yeah. this. With, even and, without and food, I'm going. I on. want yeah. to have more with you right. about the future of Israel and whether Israel can survive. Survive is the right. operative word. Right. I mean, it's all about survival, uh, and whether it in fact will survive. Um, you know, depending on what, what we predict will happen right. or what these what various it look, forces, what it will look like. I mean, I think Israel will. will look like. I think Israel will survive. The question is what it will what it will be like. But let's let's connect with sure. BDL for a minute. BDL I'm, uh, or BDS or BD, BDS. I'm sorry. BDS. Sure, sure. Yeah, the boycott organization. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I mean, I, I have my concerns that that, that could be a, 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 a Trojan horse kind of thing where you think it's trying to do one thing, but it's really trying to do another. Mm -hmm. uh, I just like your view of um, its um, legitimacy in view of the fact that there are human rights in many places and uh, BD, BDS and BDS, its, its right. progenitors don't seem to care about human rights violations elsewhere, only in Israel. Um, and, and the fact that it has a negative effect on world opinion and it gathers, it gathers followers who who could be straight anti-Semitic, too. So is BDS helping the situation or hurting it? Helping or hurting the situation. That's, that's a very tough question. You should have told me this yesterday so I could think about driving <laughs> in. Um, I would say, well, I'm going to give you a not very helpful BDS, answer. But maybe you should Yeah, let me explain. Uh, so the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement is a movement of uh, about the last 10 years or so. Uh, and it is an effort to uh, obviously boycott, divest from, and sanction uh, Israel. But uh, it has certain uh, points of contact. So there are BDS advocates who emphasize uh, boycotting uh, the settlements or, the, or what's called the occupied territories. So for in Europe, for example, the EU passed legislation that any item produced in an occupied territory has to say that on the label as the point of origin. It can't say Israel, for example. So that's one target. And then presumably the target would be just those areas and something manufactured in Haifa or Tel Aviv, et cetera. Okay. Another more recent point, and probably for your viewers who have been reading or, or listening to American events, is the, the current strategy uh, to boycott uh, Israeli academic institutions and Israeli scholars and students. There was a school in the Midwest. Yeah. Right, and there have been, uh, s that uh, recently, last six, six weeks to two months, has focused on um, a couple of very high profile incidents. Uh, there were two potential writers of letters of recommendation at the University of Michigan. One was a graduate student, uh, one was a professor who waited until he had tenure to do this, who re refused to write letters of recommendation for undergraduates who wanted to study at an Israeli university. And among those universities was Haifa, in which, in fact, if you ever go to a classroom in Haifa or walk the halls, you'll hear as much Arabic as Hebrew, if not more. There are Arabic professors, there are Palestinian professors. So their, their target uh, makes one wonder. Um, but the point there is to try to, to isolate Israel not in an economic sense so much, but in a scholarly academic sense, which I think the BDS people uh, agree will filter down. So for example, if, if somebody's kid can't get a letter, maybe the first reaction would be anger, not getting the letter, but the second reaction might be, well, let's see why that, that letter. Um, it is a recent event, but there is a long standing history of boycotting Jews and Israel. There was, of course, the Arab boycott. There was the Pepsi boycott. Uh, as everybody knows, and I'm wary of using this reference because you know the Jewish law, that if you refer to Hitler, you lose the discussion. It's, <laughs> yeah, if you refer to the Shoah, you lose the debate. But I'm going to refer to the Shoah without uh, losing the debate, I hope, our discussion. Um, of course, the boycott of Jewish goods in Germany. <coughs> That's how much of, of the Shoah, uh, one of the earliest stages. So there's also a tradition. So when you put the BDS down, on a piece of paper and discuss it, um, you think about, yes, something should be done to try to get Israel uh, to negotiate towards a peace, all right? Some sense of justice. That's probably a good idea about any country. So the next question is, why Israel? Some BDS supporters who I know quite well also <clears throat> are, are happy to put pressures on other countries, but the argument often is that um, 
Israel receives a tremendous amount of U.S. aid. And therefore, we as U.S. citizens should have some say in how the money is used. Kind of civil disobedience, Henry David Thoreau argument. Okay, so that's one of the ways they respond to, to your uh, significant and kind of natural question, which is, well, I look at the newspapers from Burma. I look at newspapers about China. Turkey, our alleged ally, has more journalists in jail than any other country in the world, uh, which doesn't say not necessarily very much, because other countries obviously kill their journalists. I mean, <laughs> Turkey has it in jail. So one response is, and it's a very reasonable response, is why boycott, divest, sanction Israel? And one response to your question about why not other places is that Israel and U.S. have a very special relationship. Now, here we get to the potential sheep-wolf problem, though, because when you discuss a very special relationship, it's not just U.S. money going to Israel, but why is U.S. money going to Israel? And we get back very often to this APAC conspiracy argument. So I would encourage any of your listeners and viewers, uh, uh, if you go online, don't just read the article, read the comments to the articles. Mm. And very interesting enough, quite often we eventually get back you know, it might begin with uh, what are recognized Israeli human rights violations. The U.S. has, I mean, the U.S. has children at the border. Uh, so, again, it's not unique to Israel. And then it's the argument is, well, Israel gets a lot of U.S. support. Why do they get that support? APAC is pulling strings. So you can see emerging, right? There may very well be people who are sincerely, honestly recognized uh, for human rights interests and they may or may not consciously integrate themselves with others who really don't have those interests, but are using those interests as a hammer yeah. to nail. So what else about uh, the BDS movement? Uh, so the BDS movement also um, participates with um, local American churches. So uh, the Presbyterians, for example, have voted to support sanctions. Uh, the Society of Friends is currently debating here within Honolulu. Quite often, uh, BDS will invite a speaker, and that speaker will both speak on campus and at one of the local churches. Again, the churches have an interest in human rights. Some of them, though, probably also include members who are not particularly uh, interested in uh, the sanct submitted, right? yeah, or sanctity of Jews. I would say that perhaps one of the most important components, though, of church participation is a reminder about the significant number of Palestinian Christians. So this is not just you know, a Jewish, a Muslim issue. It is a question of Palestinian Christians. It doesn't seem Christians. like a, a, refined, uh, a refined kind of analysis. Just jump on the bandwagon with BDS. But what about the other side of that? Um, it, BDS is growing. And, and that uh, I told you about this defector. He, he spoke mm -hmm. of generations of 15 years. Why 15 years? Because 15 years is a period, uh, it's a generation of education. And that's what the Russians, according to the sky, mm -hmm. believe. So, you know, when you have anti-Semitism in whatever form, whatever wolf's clothing, Helen of Troy, whatever it is, on campus, you're going right to that 15-year um, educational generation. And my, my feeling, my, my, I'm the simple son here, <laughs> my feeling is that it's growing on campus. It's on so many campuses. It's ubiquitous in this country, much more so than five or ten years ago. Am I right? You are right. And so uh, is a growing um, movement to uh, celebrate Israel, celebrate Judaism, have uh, Jewish classes on campus. In a way, we're back to the old debate. Uh, you know, what, what's the best way to um, respond to bad information? The best way is still good information, not censorship. And I wear two different uh, kippot on this one, because even though um, I participate on campus in trying to at least uh, know about BDS, uh, where it is appropriate, I do support their rights to academic freedom. Um, and the BDS movement, the anti-BDS movement has swung, in my mind, too far in the opposite direction. Two examples. Um, the Israeli government really has a lot more to worry about than funding anti-BDS efforts in the United States. 
and the U.S. government is putting, a, uh, the Israeli government is putting resources into that. Mm. And I think that's a shanda. That's mm. not appropriate. Um, and secondly, there is a, a Ben Cardin from Maryland has proposed a bill which is going through Congress. Everybody wants to get away for Christmas, so I don't know if it's going to get through now, but essentially makes illegal anybody who uh, participates in the boycott or expresses. I've heard about so, that. Okay. Is that a chance of passing? Well, uh, it, it depends upon who you ask, right? So I can tell you that if it does pass, we're going to have a flood of anti-APAC, anti-Semitic, anti-Israeli uh, PR. Sure. Um, if it doesn't pass, I hope we have an equally strong celebration of both American civil liberties and the fact that APAC does not pull all the strings. But you ask me about the, the growth of BDS. And yes, compared to 15 years ago, there are, are more uh, students and faculty members active in the BDS movement. There are far, there are far more uh, students participating in Students for Justice in Palestine. All that's true. Okay. But the other side is also true that the um, 10, 10 chancellors at the UC campuses, all the UC campuses, uh, just signed a public letter uh, saying that uh, expressions of violence, expressions of intolerance, et cetera, towards Jews in Israel are not acceptable and that they will not participate in the boycott. So the official UC position is not to participate in this boycott. So you really have a yin-yang dialectic going on here. Um, it makes much better press to talk about mm -hmm. UCLA hosting the, uh, uh, the Students for Justice in Palestine. But again, the, the US, uh, the, I'm sorry, the UCLA chancellor made it quite clear that yes, it is a academic freedom issue, but the academic freedom is not tantamount to institutional support. If we start, <clears throat> you know, controlling from outside. Now, the fair game would be, and this is my challenge to be the S movement, the fair game is Israel hands off, but Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, yeah. Iran, yeah. stop sending money to support these movements Why as well. Why don't they so do Saudis, that? That would, would be that, more constructive. Well, I'll do that, but I would also advocate that Israel uh, just turn the spigots off. I mean, really, if Israel has a lot, if Israel's worried about students at UCLA, um, I think it's a little better to look closer to home and think about what's going on at home. Um, mm -hmm. The U.S. is not going to abandon Israel. That's not going to happen. I know that there's three new Congress, three new reps that were elected, and people are getting uh, their bowels in an uproar. Those are three out of several hundred. They're Muslim reps. That's, sure, those are the ones is, you're talking about? Yeah, but about? this is a democracy. You know, if, if they're, this is a democracy. Uh, the only difficulty with one of them is she switched her position after getting elected. But she, I don't think she's actually the first politician to switch positions after getting elected. Okay, I, I think this, again, is a, is a misguided or misefficient uh, allocation of our human resources and money and time. Uh, decide what you want. Do you want the single state, the dual state, et cetera, and advocate for that, publicly advocate. Uh, I have a very dear friend, um, Yehuda Bauer, who's a scholar at Yad Vashem, and I'm going to just echo his view, which is everybody else should get their stinking figures, fingers out of this issue. <laughs> the U.S., Egypt, Lebanon, <laughs> Iran, everybody and f force the Israelis and the Palestinians. That's the old problem in the Middle East, isn't it? It goes back to Syria, doesn't it? <laughs> Everybody has always had their fingers, including the Greeks in that region. Peter, but, yep. we got out of time. Okay, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much, as always. Can a great we pleasure. continue this as more? Absolutely, and I have another one of these, so I don't even have to do a lot. Yeah, okay, I'm yeah. going to get a few. Okay, yeah, it was lovely, of course. And a very late Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Yeah, or early for next year. Yeah, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.